In this module, students will also be expected to complete assignments, and those assignments will consist of software that they will have to write. The software will be assessed, it will form part of their semester mark, and then count towards their final mark. The assignments will not be covered in this video series. We will cover that via another channel. But I think it makes sense to say a couple of things about the software that will be developed uh, at this stage as a broad background context again. So this is the final of our preface videos. It's the final one in which we set the scene before we get to the actual content of the module. Our intention with the software that students have to write is to give them a practical feeling for what occurs when one writes uh, such software. And in particular, it is intended to enable them to talk about protocols. Because in every assignment, new protocols will be introduced and uh, they will have to study those protocols, typically from the RFCs that describe the protocols, and implement them. Now, if one wants to build a distributed system, there are many architectures that are available. Um, one can think about peer-to-peer -peer architectures, and peer-to-peer -peer has even changed meaning over the years, in years gone by, if you had two mainframes and none of them was the master, then arguably they were peers, and in that sense the two mainframes that were networked uh, used some form of peer-to-peer -peer communication. In later years, peer-to-peer -peer networks, referred to networks, where there was no master and everyone was a peer, and whatever you wanted to uh, access on the network was available via one or more of these peers of these peers and you somehow had to connect the appropriate peer doesn't matter we're not going to be particularly concerned about either of those two notions in this module another way in which you will write uh, distribute software in the real world is that you will use remote procedure calls and uh, this will hide the networking from you. Uh, you just know that you're calling a procedure that may or may not be situated somewhere else on the network. Or if you're working in an object-oriented system, then you may use some middleware where there is an object request broker or an ORB that will facilitate communication between the various objects in your system. The architecture that we will use is the plain old client-server architecture. And I'll say a bit more about the client-server architecture in a moment or two. Our intention, as I've said, is not to teach you how to write distributed systems. Our intention is rather to get you to understand the protocols. And the client-server architecture is simple enough so that one doesn't need to get bogged down in other details. One can simply focus on the protocol. And just for the sake of completeness, where one has a client-server architecture, one has two tiers, the client and the server, but uh, we should also point out that many systems are developed as multi-tiered systems where your client may talk to a server and the server may talk to a backend and so on. Now, yet again, that is closer to what one will encounter in the real world if you write real software, but we do not require that in order to write software to get to know the operation of protocols. In computer science, we very often use metaphors. As one example, Many years ago, people would work as computers. They were people who computed certain values. We build a machine, 
that took over their job and we said that this machine is like a computer, it does the same job as a computer does and therefore we're going to call it a computer. In the same sense, uh, we developed uh, this little tool. Someone said it pretty much looks like a mouse, so let's call it a mouse. Uh, it is like a mouse. Yeah, this one doesn't have a tail anymore, but who cares? And in the same way, we use metaphors in the world of networking. To set the scene, if one sits down in an American restaurant, someone will uh, walk over and say, my name is Joe or my name is Jane and I will be your server today and I will be around just now to take your order. So a server is someone who takes your orders and then eventually delivers the food. And that's the metaphor we're using. You are the, the client, and you've placed your order, and the server uh, acts on that and provides whatever you've ordered. In the networking context, uh, we've adapted the notion such that a server is a piece of software that waits for requests that arrive from clients and whenever a client issues a request, that request uh, is seen by the server, the server processes it and returns a result to the client. That's the origin of the notion and that's the way in which it is still being used uh, today. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, metaphors that we will also talk about in due course, but we have to explore this notion of a client-server architecture in a bit more detail. As I've said, it's really one of the simplest architectures one can imagine, but it also gives us the greatest opportunity to le really learn about protocols, and that is our purpose. On a couple of occasions, we have said that network software will typically be layered. And uh, we already hinted that some functionality will be encapsulated in each layer. So from a high la layer where your server may be sitting down to some physical layer where the actual message is transmitted via a wire or something like that. However, uh, we, we also have to warn you that such encapsulation is not always nice and clean. Uh, sometimes uh, one layer will have to know something about another layer, uh, unfortunately. That's life. But... Uh, once you know that, you can deal with it. Now, one of the mechanisms in which we will express our wish to talk to a specific server is the notion of a port. We will soon enough say that a port really fits on layer 4 of the ISO's I model. Watch the next video to, to see more about that. And we are really here talking on layer 7, the application layer. Again, watch the next video to see more about that. So we will sometimes crisscross uh, across these layers, and that's inevitable. But uh, despite that, we can still uh, seem to be puristic and talk about proper peer-to-peer -peer communication in the sense that every layer really only talks to its to the same that it sits on layer seven will talk to layer seven and layer six on to layer six and so on. So uh, to make this concrete, just again, we've just said that in order to say which server you want to use, you will specify which socket you want to use. Uh, sockets are just numbers. So when a message arrives at a computer's networking software, it will look at the number. And if it sees that this message is intended for socket 80, uh, in other words, uh, as you have probably guessed by now, we are talking about a web request, 
the operating system will say, ah, I have a server that handles web requests that is somehow bound to port 80, and I'm just going to give the request to that server. In principle, it doesn't uh, make any difference. I can associate any protocol with any port, but in practice, uh, the low order ports, the small numbers, have been standardized. So you know port 80 is typically used for web services, and you may also know about a couple of other ports by now. And what you open up uh, on the port then is a mechanism that associates that port or that socket I will talk about the difference in a moment associates that port or socket with that particular server if you want to send email then the appropriate software may be bound to port 25 so if a message arrives and it is intended for port 25, then it uh, will be relayed to the email server because port 25 is associated with email and so on. And there's a little footnote to this use of port 25 that I'll add uh, once we get to uh, email messages and so on. For the time being, we can just uh, assume port 25 is the email port. In fact, uh, what you can go and Google is uh, well-known ports, and you will get a list of these port numbers or these socket numbers. On the screen at the moment, you can see uh, three types of ports or sockets. There are the well-known ports. Those are the ones that are used for defined purposes. Yes, you can use them for something else. Uh, there's no rule that says you have to use a specific port. But generally speaking, web servers will be waiting on, let's say, port 80. And if you use a different uh, port for your web server, then it means uh, that whoever wants to access your web server has to specify which port or which sockets should be used. Um, you've probably seen URLs that end with uh, colon and then some other port to be used. If it's port 80 or one of the standard ports uh, for secure web communication, then you don't have to specify explicitly which one will be used. The picture on the screen at the moment shows you the three categories of ports that you may encounter. There are the well-known ports, and those are ports that have been registered with IANA, and they fulfill their specific function. Just as an aside, the ones that I'm showing you are for the TCP protocol. We will talk about other protocols and also about uh, TCP in a subsequent video, so don't worry about the details there at the moment. Following the registered ports, uh, we have the assigned ports. Now, the assigned ports are ports that have been assigned to specific applications or application servers. However, they are not registered solely with that specific server or that specific service that specific application. If you want to, you can use them for something else as well. In particular, if that particular service or uh, software is not being used on your network. And then finally, there are the dynamic ports. Uh, they also are sometimes called uh, ephemeral ports. The reason is that they cannot be used for any specific purpose. More precisely, you cannot register with them with uh, IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. They are simply there for whoever needs a port just quickly. A moment or two ago, I said I tried to clarify the difference between sockets and ports. It's easier said than done. Uh, in a nutshell, a socket is uh, a port that has been opened on some particular machine. So the two are essentially the same. 
except that a socket is there, it's ready for a network connection to plug into it, whereas a port is a more abstract notion of a number without referring to a specific machine necessarily. Uh, hopefully that is clear enough. Now in order to write software on this level, you have to know what you want to write. What do you want to code? Is the server or is it a client? And the assignment will usually be pretty clear about which of the two you will have to write. In fact, in this module, you will only have to write one of the two, either a server or a client. And then to convince us that your piece of software works, you have to use some standard server or client on the other end. In other words, if your assignment is to write a client, then you have to connect it to a server that we know about, and you have to show us that you can interact using your client with that server, and therefore they are speaking the same language. Or if you have to develop a server, then you will be expected to use some well-known client to access your server. Uh, just as one example, if you are expected to write some form of a web server, then we will expect you to use a browser to access your software. You're not going to write the software on both ends, except perhaps, who knows, in the very last assignment. Let us start with a case where you have to write a server. Uh, to write a server, you have to pick some port that is not being used on that particular machine. So rather stay away from the, the assigned ports. What I often do in these examples, just to, to make my life easy, is to pick one of the dynamic ports because that uh, is not supposed to really interfere with anything. When it may interfere, we'll talk about just now. And uh, for whatever reason, my favorite port, uh, when I just want to write a quick piece of software, is port number 55555. So five fives, that is in the dynamic range, so it will typically be used for ephemeral purposes but I am using it here in a slightly more static role. So what I will do is I will write my software uh, to handle the functions that we are expecting. So those commands that the client may send, and remember we're busy writing the server, so we are expecting standard commands as per the protocol specification, to arrive from some well-known client. So we will write our software, and this software will at some point say, I'm going to wait at that particular port for any requests that may be sent my way. Now, we are opening this port on a specific machine, and hence uh, it is a socket, and you will therefore execute some command where you will say, open a server socket for me. When you issue such a command, it means your software will stop and it will wait, and it will be waiting at that port, and whenever a request arrives for that socket, it will take that uh, request it will unpack it because you will expect a string to follow it. You will unpack it into its various fields, run the program in the way in which you run it, and then you will return the results and you will wait for the next request.
clearly uh, the design that I've just given you is one where you can only handle one request at a time. So if the request arrives and your server socket sees, ah, here is a request, and then it goes away, it handles it, and then it returns the result. While it is busy processing, it is not waiting for another request. For many applications, that may be good enough, but uh, if you want to try and take things a little bit further, then you may have something that will accept the request, pass it off to some piece of parallel software to handle it, and then immediately get your main program to do back and wait at the port again, at this server socket again for any subsequent calls. So it will really be a, a fraction of a second for you to spawn an instance of the actual server that's going to handle the request and return to the server socket and wait again. But that's the essence in which you will write server software. To write client software, you will ask your system to open a connection to a socket on some machine. So here you will provide two parameters. The one parameter will be which address do I want to connect to? And the other address, which socket on that machine do I want to connect to? So if you open a server socket, as we've said in a moment or two ago, it's on this machine. This machine becomes the server machine, uh, the machine on which your software happens to be running. However, if you are writing a client, then the client will talk to some machine that may be somewhere else in the world. At the very least, it is hopefully somewhere else in your building or not your own machine. It is a machine that is sitting somewhere off on the network and you will specify the address and the socket. So whenever you say open a, a client socket, then it means uh, that connection will be established and then you can start sending requests via that connection and they will go straight to the server. The server will process them and the server will then return the result to you. Uh, uh, in all of this, uh, there are a couple of fine detail points that we need to think about. If, for example, you've just written a web server and this web server waits on uh, socket 55555 on some machine, then your client will say, open a URL on that machine, so you will specify either the name of that machine or the address of that machine, and you will also say, open port and give 55 to direct it to the appropriate port. Now, whenever your browser sends out this request, the browser will have to be able to obtain a result. What happens at a low level is that this connection that is established between your machine and the server is that your machine is assigned some dynamic address, one of these large numbers that it will temporarily use to receive a response. So if, for example, your machine happens to open a connection to a web server, and let's say it opens it and it gets the dynamic address 54321, then it will direct it at your server, which happens to be sitting on 55555, and when the request comes back, it will be sent from your original destination machine, which is now the source for the response. So it will be sent from port 55555, and it will be uh, aimed at, it will be directed at port 54321, which is the port where your client is waiting for a response. And the moment when it gets that response, it discards this ephemeral port. That's what makes them dynamic or ephemeral that are only used for short durations normally. 
um, and therefore they can be discarded. So this is the one problem that you may encounter is that when you say, I want to open a server socket at port 55555, that port may actually be used for ephemeral purposes and you may not be able to open it. It hardly ever happens in real life um, on a typical machine that's not very busy. That port, because there are so many of them, not because there's anything special about that port, that port tends to be open and available. And you can therefore uh, use it in most cases. But one of the messages is whatever you do will probably return an error code to you and it behooves you to check that error code. Because if you try and open a server socket and it can't open it because that server socket is in use, then uh, your software will not work. And if you received an error message uh, but you didn't bother to check it, it will take you ages to figure out why your software is not working or even why your software is working intermittently. So therefore, whenever you get an error code as a response, check it. Make sure that there is no error, that the operation completed successfully. Else, as I said, your software may simply not work or may sometimes not work and you may spend weeks trying to debug it. In order to illustrate the concepts of clients and servers a little better, I'm going to use a client that you've probably been advised not to use. The reason why you've been advised not to use it is because it does not encrypt its communications and uh, it is fairly easy to sniff your password. However, I'm working on my own network here, uh, so I am pretty confident that no one's sniffing it. And therefore, I can say I want to open a Telnet connection to that particular computer, which also belongs to me on my home network. Um, in fact, that's the one I want to connect to. And what Telnet will normally give is you is a virtual terminal. So the moment when I hit enter, I will hopefully get a login message. So let me quickly log in. I'll see you just now. Okay, and we are logged in. You can see a message that is displayed there about when last I was logged in and all sorts of other details that may or may not be interesting. Um, but uh, the point that I want to illustrate is that I, if, if you looked carefully at the starting screen, I was using a Windows command line interface and now I am on a Linux computer. More specifically, this is a Raspberry Pi that I'm connected to. And the typical commands such as ls don't have many files there, but it should uh, list the files for me or I can say ls-a and so on. Um, I can now use that Raspberry Pi as if I had a normal connection, a normal terminal plugged into it. Let's do something a bit more fun. In all of these Unix machines, in the ETC directory, you have a list of protocols that it knows about. And if we just look at the first couple of them, there you will see the description of them. Push spacebar and we get another screen full. You can go and do this with your own machine. Uh, my intention is really to show you that what I have is a terminal. If I say Q, then I uh, escape from this. And then I can simply say Control D and I'm logged out. And I am in fact again in my Windows command line and I can clear the screen. Note, uh, Telnet is not available de by default uh, from your screen, from your Windows command line interface. You have to go to Windows Additional Features and enable it. Secure Shell will also give me a connection, a virtual terminal to that Raspberry Pi, uh, just like Telnet did. 
but it is the recommended way of connecting via networks because it uses encryption. So if I hit enter here, it will ask me for the password. Uh, let me just say goodbye for you for a moment. And there you can see I am logged in and uh, various interesting pieces of information. I can yet again list my files in this case with uh, a bit more details or I can yet again go and look at uh, that uh, protocols file, list of protocols. It's going to give me exactly the same information that we had previously, We're going to pipe this via less and there we get the information and another screen full of information and I can say control D to log out. I am back in my Windows command line and I can say clear screen to get rid of all that. What I've just done here to emphasize this uh, another time, I've used a Telnet client on my Windows machine and I used it to connect to a machine that happened to be a Raspberry Pi and I could execute all the Raspberry Pi commands as if I had a local connection to that Raspberry Pi on my machine here. To illustrate this in a somewhat different manner, I'm going to open another secure shell here. You can see that I'm coming in from my Windows command line and I want to run secure shell and I'm going to specify a different username for that machine or for, um, use a different name to use on that machine. And it gives me the warning that I need access to go ahead with it. Uh, I'm going to kick you off for a moment. And we are back on. You can see I'm logged into this machine. And you may see that we are running an Edge OS machine here. So it's not a typical Linux or Unix machine as such. In fact, I am logged into a router here. So I can try things like LS and uh, it will seems as if it's willing to help. There just aren't any files. But if I ask it for help, then it shows me all the commands that it can handle. Now, to convince you that this is actually a router, one of the commands that you can see on that list, if you watch very carefully, you will see that there is a show, and I can say show the interfaces for me on this machine. And there you can see that this is a 12-port router, and uh, it has about four networks plugged into it. There is the local network that it also has that it's connected to, but four external networks that I'm running in my house. So it can go through what other things it can do. But the, the point that I'm trying to make here is this secure shell here is not intelligent at all. It simply sends through whatever I type to the server. And in this case, it's a totally different server. It speaks a different language from typical Unix bash. Mm -hmm. But if I know what the commands are to enter, I can enter them. They will be relayed there and they will be relayed back. I can log out and you can see my connection is closed. I'm back into my Windows machine. The fact is that I can use Telnet because remember what Telnet's going to do really, it's going to send uh, characters back and forth, normally between me and a Telnet server. Let us now use Telnet in a somewhat non-standard way I'm going to Telnet to the Raspberry Pi that I Telneted to previously, but this time I'm going to tell it to connect to port 25. Now, if we are lucky, there will be a mail server running on port 25 because 
55 is the port that is used for mail serving. We should also look at port 587, but that's a story for another day. So let's see what happens when I try and connect. Was a little bit of waiting, and then we get this heading. And one of the important things that you may see that we are getting is an error message. So right at the top, we had a 220. Anything in the 200 range is good. Just like the web where you know that 300 uh, are bad, 400, you're all familiar with a 404, which says page doesn't exist, so something is wrong. And 500 usually indicates a server error. In the same sense here, 200 is good. So what I now know after having read the RFC is that the first command that I have to enter is hello and I have to introduce myself. Now usually what it expects to do is for me to type in my fully qualified domain name or IP address there. I'm just going to type in something else and see what it does. And you can see it returns. It did pick up which machine I'm actually from. Uh, again, having read the RFC, I know that the next command that I have to send out is mail from. And now I am supposed to enter the email address from whose address this originates. Let's say this is coming from me. At Oh, okay. Now, there I just made a big typo. I used backspace. This uh, protocol that I'm using is not intended for interactive use. It's not in in intended to be used via a terminal. So, why, while the character went back to the left, what I've actually managed to do is I've managed to enter a backspace into the character stream and that's going to upset the server so best way out of that is to push enter get the error message there you can see the error message and then I can try again so what I can say this time is and it says yes it's willing to accept that and then I have to can say RCPT2. Uh, oh, there's another typo. So again, I'm just going to hit enter, get the error message, and then. And hit enter, and it's saying it's not being configured to relay messages to other machines. Now that's a very common setup on many email servers. It will accept email intended for that particular machine, but not for other machines. And this is so that it cannot be abused for um, spamming and that sort of thing. So we can try and see if I uh, say RCPT Two at this point and then I'm going to use my name on this particular machine on which it is running and yes it is happy with that and then I can say next command data and that tells me I can send my message so there's a hi there and I can push enter and it did tell me once I'm done, I can just put a full stop on a line of its own. And it said, yes, it accepted that email. It will deliver it for me. And I can now say quit. And the connection is closed. Uh, this uh, connection that I made to port 25, you can see I'm back in my Windows. The point behind this entire demonstration is that if I have a server that talks plain old ASCII or clear characters at the very least, 
I can use Telnet to send those characters to it and to receive whatever characters it sends out back. I can interact as if I were, in this case, an email client. And I can get the email onto the network and I can get it to be delivered. You will use this in one of two ways. On the one hand, if you have to write a client for any particular server, then ideally what I want you to do is to use Telnet to connect to that server and enter the commands as you would use them from your program. And that helps you to see that the protocol actually works, that you can get the characters out in the way that they're supposed to go out, and therefore you can test conceptually that you have the right commands to effect whatever you want to do. Yes, you may have to be a bit creative if you get typos like I did and know what to do to get those ignored, but in the end, you can understand exactly what you are doing. Now, when you do write your client, this is your assignment that we've said you're working on, your program will then connect to the appropriate socket. In this case, it was socket 25 on that particular machine, and it would send out commands character by character, so you will be writing strings to this socket that you've opened and the strings will go via the network to the server and the server will react. One of the things to be careful of while you are writing out these character strings, there are points at which the server has to respond and it's best to wait, not best, it's necessary to wait for the server to respond before you send out the next command. So if you were just going to say, okay, for this I have to send out a hello and a mail from and the recipient to and a data and so on, and just pump those out, you will probably have a program that doesn't work. Remember, with this protocol, the very first thing that the protocol does is the server greets you. The server says hello. Now, without the server having said hello, there's no point for you to start sending out your own hello. The protocol says the server will greet you, then you have to greet the server, then the server has to send you a 200 series error code, then you can say mail from, and then the server has to send you a 200 series error code and so on. So therefore, your program, your client that you are writing, will have to behave in exactly the same way. In the same sense, if your assignment is to write a server, you can use Telnet to test that server, to see whether, when you send the appropriate commands to your server, whether whatever it returns is what you would expect and then if you've tested it and you see that it does return the appropriate things then you can use a standard client and you can use the standard client to interact with the server that you have been writing one of the aspects that i need to emphasize here is the fact that the software that you write either has to send out these characters, character by character. Yes, you can use a print line option or whatever you want to use to see out to, to send a bunch of characters as a character string. That's perfectly acceptable. But your software has to send out the characters that I've been typing into Telnet if I am writing a client. If I am writing a server, then whatever the server has to do will be written out character by character by your server software that you are writing. If you ever write commercial software that needs to send an email or act as any other client for that matter, 
you will probably use a library function. Our intention here is different. We want you to get to know the protocol. We want you to get to interact with the protocol. Therefore, you have to emulate whatever a client will do by sending out all the characters. In the case of uh, the email program uh, protocol, this was, by the way, the SMTP protocol that I used, the uh, simple mail transfer protocol. In this case, I had to send out the hello message. I had to send out the mail from. I had to send out the recipient to and so on. And that's exactly what your software should do. If, for example, your software that you are writing happens to be, a, let's say, a web server, then you know from the browser it will get commands such as get or post or whatever the case may be. And those commands that it gets should be accepted by your software as character strings. You should analyze them, pause them to figure out what the client wants, and then it should send out the appropriate responses. I know in some scripting languages, you do have a command that sends out an email in one line, and that also doesn't get around the requirement that you have to avoid libraries. The bottom line is you have to speak the protocol in your assignment. That is what we will look at when we uh, grade it, when we mark it. That is what will earn marks, whether you are speaking the protocol in the prescribed manner. We're not really interested there in all sorts of nice graphics or anything else. But if you do anything such as using a library function that encapsulates all these commands that are required by the protocol and you do not put those commands into your actual software that you've written, you have not done the assignment. Similarly, if you write a server and the request from the client comes in and you handle that with some library function, um, yes, you may use a library function to help you to unpack the, the portions of the command if it's a long character string. But the moment that you've unpacked it to see what all these commands mean, for example, yet again, if you write a web server and you get a get request, then you know you have to transmit a file. And the next value in the string that you receive will be which file should you transmit and so you can work through the rest of the line the point is as i've said multiple times we want to teach you exactly how these protocols work and in order for you to do that you have to write software that use the protocols it's not a matter of getting the program to send out email it's a matter of getting the program to speak SMTP. That is what we expect from you. If your task is to build a client, you need an operational server to, to test it against and to, to, to demonstrate it against. In the old days, lots of servers were open. It was not a problem to find an email server that you could use for testing purposes. It was not a problem to find a host of other servers. Of course, there are some servers, like web servers, that by the very way in which they work have to be open to the public uh, to at least exploit some of their functionality. But for many other servers, you simply cannot access them. The solution that I propose is that you obtain a copy of Linux and install the software that you need. So um, what this would mean is if you have an old spare PC, uh, you can load Linux on it. If you want to dual boot, you can load Linux on your laptop or whatever you use normally. Uh, it's also possible that you're already using Linux as your primary operating system, in which case you don't have a problem. Uh, if you are using Windows as your primary system, you can install Ubuntu and one or two other distributions as applications 
under Windows. You just go to the Windows shop, you find the Ubuntu server, and you install that, and then you can load your various uh, server software packages on it, also your various uh, clients if you want to do that. If you are an Apple user, iOS is based on Unix, so you already have what you need and you can go ahead and test against it. The problem with other operating systems like Windows is that one does get server software, but they tend to cost a fortune, whereas the Linux versions and even the Apple versions tend to be free of charge. They may be forks from Unix when Unix was created many, many years ago, or they may be forks from um, the GNU software that by its very definition happens to be free software. If at all possible, get some variant of the Ubuntu distribution because that is the distribution where you will probably be able to find the most help from in our local community. One of my Personal favorites is the Mint distribution, but you can use whatever you want. At the very least, I think, uh, keep it in the Debian stable uh, because that will make uh, our life easier to, to assist you. One of the other frequent questions is which programming language should you use to write your software in? Uh, the requirements are very simple. You know you will have to do some string processes, string manipulation, because to build up a request string or to receive a request string and then break it up into parts will be definitely part of what you have to do. And then uh, the second thing, you need to be able to uh, create a server socket if you're writing a server, so that you can receive incoming requests, and you need to be able to create a client socket, a socket uh, that works via a connection to some server, so that you can complete your uh, connection, so that you can communicate if you are writing a client. Shouldn't be necessary to say the following again, but let's repeat it any, in any case, because I get so many queries about this. No scripting language where the scripting language performs the entire protocol operation in one line is not acceptable, because you cannot want to use that one single statement that will read an entire web page and then assume that we will know that you are able to use the HTTP protocol at a low level. So stay away from those. You need to assemble and uh, also to unpack the character strings that form the protocol on your own. So that's the one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind that I also see time and time again is that people tend to use a language uh, where they're supposed to write a server and they simply use a web server like protocol and they shift the entire thing using JavaScript or whatever so that all the processing occurs client side. That is also not what we expect in this case. If we want you to write a server, then the server should be run on the server. If we want you to write a client, then the client should execute on the client and not on the server. So do not use languages where you move what is supposed to be a server to the client side and then do all the processing client side. We want the processing to occur server side for a server or client side for a client. Yet again, that's the way the protocols work and that is what you need to show us in your demonstrations. So what have we done in this video? We've spoken about the client server architecture that will be the one that we will use for our practical assignments. We said that for the vast majority of practical assignments you will either have to develop a client 
or a server. In both cases, we said it is important for you to play with a server. Use Telnet and work through the server commands so that you can see how the server reacts and so on. It's much easier to write code to do something once you've seen how it works. Also, if something doesn't quite work, let's say you've written a server, use Telnet to try and debug it. Another thing, if you have written your client or server and things do not quite work, print out error messages or print out what you are receiving or what you are sending, depending whether you are on the client side or the server side, so that you have something to debug. Remember, whatever you do, do not ignore any error codes that the system may return to you because those error codes are very often useful. And uh, if you ignore them, then as luck would have, it typically your program will work. And then on the day on which you demo it, it doesn't work because there was something that was inherently different. We also said that it is rather important that you find some Unix environment, some Linux environment in which you can install especially the servers that you would need, but also the clients. There are a couple of cases where you will be able to use a server that is not necessarily hosted on your own machine, but in many cases you will have to host it yourself because of all the security mechanisms that have been implemented that prevent you from using systems that are available on the internet that used to be accessible in days gone by. If at all possible, get your network distributed across at least two machines. Most of the assignments will be of the form where it will allow you to work in pairs on the assignment, Given that we are still in an isolation under the pandemic, that gives you an ideal opportunity to practice your networking skills, to, in your pair, talk to your friend's machine via the real internet. That is entirely possible. Alternatively, think about options such as using a cellular phone or a tablet or an old computer that you're no longer using that's just sitting in the corner as one of the nodes with which you are communicating. Uh, it may be worth considering buying a Raspberry Pi. No, you don't need the latest 4B model that costs quite a bit of money. A Raspberry Pi Model 1 or Model 2 uh, provides all the processing power that you would need for uh, these assignments. Yes, it may be a bit of a problem to get one of those really old ones. The, the, the point behind this latter tirade is again the, the pleasure of experiencing something that flows via the network. In a networking course that makes sense, you have to experience that. So uh, you can talk to local host, especially during early development act as if your own computer is on a network of its own on the local net. Yes, it is, uh, but that does not give one the same satisfaction as communication from one device to another device. I really advise you to do that. One of the things that we have not yet discussed that you should also use for debugging is sniffing traffic. And we will be using Wireshark for that. So you can get hold of Wireshark. However, we will only talk about Wireshark in a later uh, video. Do keep it in mind that it is a very useful tool to try and figure out why your software doesn't work if it does not work. The practical side of this course is really part of the fun. I really hope you enjoy it. It is also really part of the frustration. But as I've said somewhere else, it is this frustration that uh, is inherent in networking, but from which you also get the most satisfaction that once you've solved the problem, once you understand why it didn't work, then you've really learned something. Enjoy the module.